Hello, everyone, and welcome to the series of interviews that IPA has put together uh, for you this month. And I'm really, really excited today to be interviewing someone very special. Um, and before I start, I just want to mention that all of our interviews will be available for anybody to see on, our, on the IPA website. So please don't hesitate to go there and have a look at the wonderful interviews that we have in store for you. My special guest today is Jose Ignacio Echeverria, known as Nacho. He's the Director General of CITESA and the President of the Ibero-American Group of Publishers, PIA, which brings together representatives of publishers from the whole of Latin America, Spain, and Portugal. And he runs the website El Librero de Gutenberg out of Mexico City. And he's been publishing director at the National Autonomous University of Mexico and managing director of Empresora Azteca for more than 25 years. He was also, I'm sorry, 35 years. He was also the president of IPA's Mexican member, Kaniel. So welcome, Nacho. It's such a pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you, Bodor. It's very, very nice to see you through this uh, media and have a chance to meet. Uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you. How's everything with you in Mexico? Uh, could you speak a little louder, please? I said, how is everything in Mexico at the moment? Well, how are uh, you doing? How's the publishing industry? <laughs> Well, it's, uh, it's a bit difficult, I would say, or, uh, or rather very difficult. Uh, actually, the publishing industry had been uh, slowing down, for, has been slowing down for the past uh, five years. And obviously this pandemic is not helping at all. Uh, sales in particularly in, in Mexico have been going down about 20% in the last two months. And, mm -hmm. But it's uh, something that's happening all in, in, in all Latin America. And, and Spain also, you know, it's, I, I think it's a worldwide situation. So it's a, a bit uh, difficult for all of us. Absolutely. And um, I know we didn't have the opportunity to meet uh, during book fairs or for the IPA Congress this year. So I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to connect with you on a one-to-one -one on Zoom and really get to know you a little bit better and for our listeners and the people watching us today to get to know you personally a little better and the work that you're doing. So let me ask you my first question about the Ibero-American Publishers Group. Tell me a little bit about this group. I know it's a longtime member of IPA. Please let us know who are your members and when was the group formed and what are the main reasons for your association? Thank you. Um, the group was uh, initiated in 1979. Um, there were two, there were four uh, members that uh, from Argentina, four people, one from Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico that started. I only have the names of Colombia, of uh, Argentina, Isai Classe, and uh, Brazil, Alaves, but those are, you know, Alaves. Um, it started to kind of group, make a group that would mirror the European Association of Publishers, okay? And uh, it, it was with the intention originally to represent all countries in, in Latin America. At that time, it was only Latino Americano. It was not Ibero-Americano, so it not, did not include Spain and Portugal. And uh, it, it had to do very much with a program that the United States had at that time through the United States Information Agency, which had uh, budgets for the translation of American books into the uh, Portuguese and Spanish language, language in, in Latin America. So it was done to kind of regulate that because otherwise it could become um, a little complicated. That program disappeared a long time ago, unfortunately, because it was very good for, for Latin American publishers. And uh, after that, it became more like an uh, association in which we tried to um, influence our governments in having policies that could benefit publishing. Uh, every, every country has a different uh, attitude to, to 
to these uh, uh, policies. And uh, we are 19 countries at this moment forming member uh, Grupo Iberoamericano. So it's very difficult to have, a, to say one uh, policy about Vox or what's happening in, in Latin America. You have to like go through different uh, uh, countries or regions to more or less get, get an idea. The whole, <laughs> you can say unfortunately, is that it's as in the rest of the world, publishing industry is suffering a lot with this pandemic situation. But again, it has to be on a regional, on a country by country basis. Okay, I understand. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a great um, opportunity for all of you to really exchange um, information and ideas and suggestions, especially at this time where when we're all going through some period of uncertainty. I think it helps uh, to have this network that you can all consult each other and really share best practices. So I think, you know, I think you're one, it's wonderful to have this association in place uh, right now. Could you give us a little bit of context on the publishing industry in Latin America? Approximately how many publishers are there? How many bookstores? And if you can give us some numbers as well on what's the turnover of the publishing industry last year, for example, it would really help us put it, everything into context. Yes, uh, we're not very uh, good with statistics in Latin America, so it's going to be very difficult to give you a number for last year. Um, uh, up to 2018, we, we had around 7,000 publishers in Latin America. That's excluding, obviously, Spain and Portugal. Um, there, are, there are around four to 5,000 bookstores in all Latin America, which, as you can imagine, it's a very small figure because we are about 400 million Latin Americans. So it's a very, very low uh, uh, figure again. For example, um, if we compare it with Spain, which is a Spanish language country, obviously, uh, we, we have, Spain has about one bookstore for every 12 to 14,000 uh, um, uh, inhabitants. Argentina has one for about every 40,000 inhabitants. And in Mexico, we have less than one for 80,000 inhabitants. So it's a very, very bad uh, distribution chain. And mm, some of them are not even, not even uh, bookstores, you know, they're sort of paper books, uh, per paper stores, like for Stationary paper shops. school, yeah. And then they sell some books, particularly textbooks on the, on the school time. Yeah, so it's, it's not too, too easy. Uh, the distribution systems are very complicated. Mail is extremely expensive. It's, it's cheaper to send a book from uh, Madrid to Paraguay than from uh, Uruguay to Paraguay sometimes. It's, it's, really, it's really bad. Uh, our governments- So familiar. I mean, um, it sounds very much like the Arab publishing industry, if I can make a comparison. And when you're explaining yes. it to me, I'm just nodding my head because I see a lot of similarities with the publishing industry and the Arab world. It's very fragmented. We have a lot of problems with the distribution and there are not enough bookstores. So it sounds quite familiar. Um, I, would, I would like to ask a question about Mexico specifically, and then maybe we can take it to Latin America if possible. So we've been, I mean, the whole world has been under lockdown for months now. So what has the situation been like in Mexico specifically right now? And I understand that you touched a little bit upon it at the beginning, but can you give us an idea of where the main challenges are. And also, I'd like you to tell me where you think there are some opportunities for reinvention of our business models. If we can start with Mexico first and then talk a little bit general on Latin America. Okay, well, uh, in Mexico, we have a, and I'm sorry for the expression, but a very wishy-washy situation, okay? We're supposed to be on a sort of voluntary lockdown, but, uh, you know, that's whatever you want to call, you, you can do whatever you want to do. We're supposed to be home working, most of us, but then there are some essential indus uh, industries that do not 
uh, uh, clothes. Uh, but in general, uh, everything that has to do with the publishing industry has been closed. Okay, bookstores are not open yet. Uh, obviously, publishing is done through teleworking or home office or whatever you want to call it. And, and the printing is, not, is also not, not working. So physically, there's, there's very little publishing, in, uh, very little work in the publishing industry. On, on, on a general situation in Mexico, uh, the pandemic is, is uh, growing in spite of the government figures that say it's, it's slowing down, but they tell us they're more dead every day. So we don't really know how to match that, that information because it's slowing down, but we have more dead people than before. Um, I would say on a, on a very serious way that we do not have in Mexico a strategy to control this, to try to control this pandemic. So it's not helping at all, okay? Mm -hmm. We're supposed, we're at the height of the pandemic now. Next week we will be again at the height of the pandemic. Every week it grows. But mm -hmm. apparently we're going to start working in five days, going out, unlocking. So it's, you know, it's very, it's very, very confusing, scary. I think, yeah. It's confusing. The government has decided not to have uh, more tests done, which is what worldwide seems to be uh, the law, the, the way to work. So we do not really know, uh, we do not have very precise figures. Some of the uh, uh, states around the country have really, uh, uh, have really, um, how would I say, are, are confronting the federal government because they say they're not going to follow the rules. So it's, as you say, the word is very confusing. What is it like specifically for the publishing industry? If I could just ask you to give us like some examples of what's happening. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Do you see any opportunity for changes in our business models uh, specifically for publishers who are dealing with um, the lack of sales in bookstores, the uh, lockdown and the situation of uncertainty in uh, Latin America and specifically in Mexico? Well, yes, I've been an advocate of a, a change in our model business. Uh, I, I think uh, we, we have a model that's about 500 years old since Gutenberg started the, the uh, mobile print. <laughs> and I think it's time that uh, our publishers become more aware of the, the opportunities we are. And this might be the chance for, for a great uh, advance in, in our uh, role of a model of of business. Um, I, I see the publisher, not the publishing houses, okay? In Spanish, we have a problem. Editor is the same for editor and publisher. So yeah. it's, uh, yeah. it's a bit confusing. So the, 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 the editor, uh, not the publishing house, I see him much more as a curator of contents. Mm -hmm. And as a curator of contents, you can decide whether you want them to be published in paper, in audio, in television series, films, whatever, podcasts, whatever you, you, you have. I believe that the a book in paper and print will be lasting very, very, very much many years. But I think we have to have a little more vision and open ourselves to other possibilities. Otherwise, some people are going to do it. Other people are going to do it. We're the proprietors of stories. We have the content. Why don't we try to open it in other, in other manners? Now, that's for the content. As a publisher, you, you have to also look at different change, uh, uh, looks of dis, uh, ways of distribution and getting to, to the market. Um, there are many different ways to reach the market now. You don't have to have a huge warehouse full of books and all the... Uh, has to do with the logistics, uh, people working in there, having mixed inventories and never know when, when you really have a book where or, or not. I think that we have to look at things like Ingram's uh, Publishing on Demand, which you send your, your uh, PDF there and they have, in Latin America, they have about five plants all over and they print one book, a thousand books, 10,000 books and deliver them for you. So yeah. it's really changing the, the world. And as for uh, the kind of, of marketing we do, we have to be more aggressive 
uh, also we have to look at uh, uh, as libraries as a different kind of ally than some years ago. Many libraries have changed. They're more open, they're more, they have coffee shops, they have a lot of more to offer, they offer presentations. But still, we have to make a, a much, much closer alliance, but the, on a very proactive way. In other words, we as a publisher, in theory, you should have a, a con content with your reader because he's the only one. And it's so much like the uh, med medical industry. Okay, you go to the doctor, but he's not your consumer. The, your, the, your sick, the per sick person is a consumer. And in the library, he's not your client. He's just your channel to reach the consumer, which is the one who reads. So we should be able to have mailing lists in agreement with the uh, library uh, bookstores in order to reach these customers and tell them, well, like, you know, like some, like adults. The people who bought this book have, have been also been interested, or this author had, that you bought about eight months ago has a new title. Would you be interested in looking at it? Things like that, I think. Okay. That's really I think that's valid for all Latin America. That's really interesting. I mean, I, I've seen um, quite a, a few good examples of, of new ideas come up right now with lockdown and with the coronavirus pandemic. People are getting creative and especially in marketing as well. I've had a chat with one of my colleagues in Nigeria and she was saying how they're using WhatsApp, for example, now to do all of their marketing. So people are getting creative and I think that's always a great opportunity. So you mentioned a little bit um, about you know print on demand and how that should be seen more as an opportunity to fulfill clients and customers needs and requirements I just want to ask you Nacho do you see um, any increase in online sales of books I know for example in my publishing house here in Sharjah and the UAE we've had a tremendous uh, increase in the demand for books and, and our online sales have gone up uh, this past month because bookstores were closed so people had to order online. Do you find that um, something that has happened in Latin America? Yes, it certainly has happened and all, all our colleagues I have been speaking to uh, 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 accepted. Uh, we don't have figures, I don't know in your case, because uh, the number one player in this which is, is the one, the big one, we, which we all know, does not release figures, so we don't really have an idea of what uh, is going on. But definitely, uh, one thing that happened here in Mexico, very interesting, this might be a good idea for, for other people, is that the Mexican uh, Chamber of uh, Publishers, the CANIEM, uh, has had a lot of meetings with the uh, Bookstores uh, Association, and now they have, and it's published every week in the bulletin of the uh, Chamber of, of, of Publishers, a list of about 60 bookstores that deliver the books to you uh, after you buy them online. This is, has been a very interesting thing because it's helping uh, local uh, uh, bookstores and smaller publishers to, to be able to reach the public, okay? I was in Havana this this year in February, just before the the uh, big pandemic started and everything. And and I also told them this because you know in in Cuba it's a very specific situation regarding uh, book exports, and uh, it's very difficult for them to export one because of the embargo that uh, has been uh, hitting this country since many many years ago. For, reasons we all are aware of, and because also of the freight, as we said, on, on the Arab countries or, on, or in all Latin America. It's so expensive to send something by, by a boat to any country. So I suggested that they should probably look at, at this uh, kind of print-on-demand situation. So you send the PDF, which is very simple, even from a country like Cuba that does not have a very good uh, internet system, but you, they still they can do it, and or the government will help them do it, and then have 50 books published in San Francisco and 100 books published in, in Rio or Sao Paulo, wherever, and it would be a, a completely different outlook, which would also help put uh, the, 
the smaller publishers, which are the ones that really have the, the most difficult time in this situation. Okay, that's so a, I really... A, that's, uh, a good, uh, that's a really good example. And I believe it's, it's advice that people need to take into consideration now, especially with all the changes that are happening. I want to quickly ask you about um, the education system in uh, Mexico and how has the government coped with the changes in online education? We're all sort of grappling now with remote learning and trying our best um, as parents and also, you know, um, as, as publishers to meet the demand that's, that's happened all of a sudden on, our, uh, on us. So, how has Mexico uh, responded to this change? And have publishers stepped up as well to contribute to online learning? Uh, and is there a system that's already in place or were there any challenges that they had to overcome? Well, there were and there are a lot of challenges. Uh, I, I think very countries, if any at all, were, were prepared to really have an online, a total online uh, educational system. Uh, uh, here, it didn't have. Uh, we we stopped schools around Feb March twenty third or something like that. And recently, about a month ago, uh, they started having online and television uh, uh, schooling. Um, in a country like mine, that uh, internet has not uh, yet uh, crossed the, the the line where you say everybody has access to internet. Uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult to have online uh, communication. So there's television also. Now, it's not only the problem of the media. I mean, that more or less can be solved with a little more money or a little more. But the problem is, how does a teacher that is, let's say, 60 years old or let's say younger, 50 years old, who has never been through, uh, forced, faced with this situation, can control what he wants to say, how he talks to the children. Uh, the houses are, are, you know, not very big. We have a, a lot of places where an apartment is about 40, 50 square meters, five, six people living in there, one computer, if at all, for the whole family. So how can you handle that? It's, it's very difficult. Uh, yeah. It's not just a question of, of uh, the system or the, pro or the programs, it's the whole sociological thing. For the other part of the questions, yes, uh, a lot of publishers have been, uh, let's say, freeing of uh, their catalogs online, so mainly children can have access to books and, and all that. Uh, uh, in, online. But again, the problem is how do they get online? There are, there are many places in my country that do not have electricity, so <laughs> much less internet, okay? Yeah, absolutely. And, I think it's proving to I, be... I'm a, sorry, and I believe this is uh, uh, applicable to most of Latin America, okay? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I hear about these challenges in Africa as well. Um, we've had many conversation with our colleagues in Africa who are also facing a lot of challenges because some areas are not connected digitally. Access to technology, access to devices is, is very minimal, let alone, you know, um, having a space to, to work. And, um, you know, I think there are many, many challenges across the world that we're facing right now. I think def it's definitely an opportunity for publishers really to reconsider um, what they're offering and what they're publishing to meet the, this new demand. I quickly want to turn um, the subject to book fairs. And I know that Guadalajara Book Fair is one of the biggest, biggest book fairs in Latin America. Um, and many of the book fairs, as we've seen, have been canceled, London Book Fair, Bologna Book Fair, and many, many others. I was just wondering, um, what are the plans for Guadalajara Book Fair later this year? I know it's quite early now, but if you have any information to share with the, with the people watching us, uh, that would be appreciated. And also, I personally want to know, because Sharjah was meant to be the guest of honor at Guadalajara Book Fair, so I just need to know whether I'm going to be there or not. I would love to be there, obviously, but we'd love to hear from you. 
Thank you. Well, I would love to see you there at Le <laughs> since we haven't been able to meet elsewhere. And, and I don't know about Frankfurt or. or, 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 or um, I think uh, uh, officially the situation is that there is going to be a Guadalajara book fair up to date, okay? Um, but we feel that it's going to be difficult, not only because what might be happening there at that time, which nobody knows. But because the, the attitude that all the world, not just publishing industry, has at this moment, it's a very sort of a carefully situation, maybe over careful, I, I do not know. And maybe the Guadalajara book fair this year will have a little bit more like a Frankfurt book fair, a bit more local, less uh, fancy as we are used to it. Uh, but I'm sure there will be some uh, big activity around it. Of course, they will not be able, I think, to have the thousands of people that go in there every day, students that come from schools and all that, because it's not uh, adequate. So that definitely has to change. Um, apparently, there's going to be a reduction in space, so uh, this would help to make it a little less, less complicated. But... Uh, if things go like they are, I really see difficult situations for, for the Guadalajara book fair. Um, although the state of Jalisco has a governor that has been very uh, proactive and although uh, facing the coronavirus situation, well, you know, their borders are open and nobody knows what, what, what really can happen. I do hope that Sharjah can, can be there. Actually, I was, um, I'm very frustrated too because I had planned along with the Canyon to have a, a seminary the Friday before the opening of a book fair uh, with three or four uh, points regarding the publishing industry in Latin America and the future of it. And I had hoped that Bodura Cassini would talk us about the possibilities of exchange between the Arab world and Latin America which I think are very big and very interesting because in, in a sense, we have a very uh, similar approach to a lot of things, family and all those things. So it was my idea and this I had spoken since February <laughs> with Juan Arsol, the president of our, our Mexican chamber. And I was you know, very excited about it. So if no. you do come, please accept. <laughs> Look, Nacho, if the flights are going to Guadalajara, I'll be there. You can guarantee that. <laughs> if we're, everything is safe and we're still going ahead with the book fair, it will be my pleasure to join you there for Guadalajara Book Fair. I think we need that face-to-face um, -face contact after having so many book fairs canceled this year. And, you know, I think we, we're really missing that interaction, so to speak. So fingers crossed. Let's uh, let's hope things go uh, go well for, for everybody. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit more about the pandemic. As you know, it's the it's the topic of uh, of the day, and everybody is talking about it right now. I I don't know whether we have solutions for this, or whether we know uh, exactly how much it's impacted um, the publishing industry. But I, I want to hear from you a little bit on how you see this playing out in the future. Obviously, we've had severely impacted, it severely impacted our book fairs. Some uh, sales have been affected by COVID-19. Travel has stopped. So a lot of the businesses have had to slow down their, their activity, especially in, in terms of uh, selling rights, I would say. I think a lot of the publishers depended on London Book Fair and, and Bologna Book Fair to sell rights, and now they've had to slow down a little bit. So what do you see in terms of Latin American publishing? Has the pandemic had a serious effect on the industry? And also, what about politicians? Is government doing anything to support publishers at this time? Are there any grants or funds dedicated for the creative industries in Latin America? Okay. Uh, yes, it has, as you say, it has had an impact on all the sales of, of, of rights. And, uh, uh, and now Frankfurt also will have a, a very heavy impact on this because I think it's also going to impact the smaller fair. 
Uh, governments have reacted on, on different manners in each of our countries, but uh, I would say that uh, something, and I, I don't know if this is only a Latin American uh, uh, phenomenon, but in our countries, and I can say that very, very seriously, all of our countries, politicians really, you know, love talking about culture, love talking about books, love talking about how important that is for, for the lives of everybody in, in their countries or the regions or whatever. But then they go. And the, what are the actual situations afterwards? But, uh, budget for culture in, in, in all of our countries has gone down and severely. In Mexico, it has gone down more than 50% in the last five years. So how can you combine that there's a really a, a care for the publishing and cultural industries when the budget goes down? They do not buy for, they do not buy publishers buying for uh, books uh, for libraries, public libraries or school libraries. They do not back. Uh, here in Mexico, it has been a terrible blow to culture. I think the same thing is happening in, in, in most of Latin America, particularly in places like Brazil, which have a very, uh, well, uh, uh, definite uh, position against uh, uh, giving grants or, uh, or backing publishers and cultural industries. And that, but it's a ruling on all Latin America. Book laws are written but not observed. Uh, again, mail, ma mailing uh, costs, which depend on the government, are, are extraordinarily high and not guaranteed. You, you can send a book, pay a lot for it, and then it never arrives or it arrives six months later. So there's, there's really no, there's really no real backing for, for, for this uh, cultural uh, industries and particularly our industry. Books, okay. Well, I think it's, it's really important for, uh, for governments to step up right now at this very challenging time for publishers. We need all the support we can get. I've seen a few great examples coming from Germany and from other places, so we hope that other countries will follow as well. Nacho, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. We don't have much time left, but if you allow me to ask you one last question, um, sure. That is not on our pre prepared list, so I'm going to take you by surprise, <laughs> if that's okay. Right. Um, so we've seen like a lot of uh, people reading more books right now with the lockdown and with the COVID-19 pandemic. Everyone's reading more books. I just was curious to know, what are you reading right now? And what would you recommend to people who are watching us today? Have you read anything interesting that you can share with us? Yes, uh, I, um, I love a, a, a Spanish woman author called Almudena Grandes, which has a series of, of uh, it's about six or seven books at this time, about the Spanish Civil War. Uh, my, my parents uh, were on the wrong side and we emigrated to, I was born in Spain, but we emigrated to America, to Mexico. And uh, so I've, I'm reading her right now. It's the last, the last title is The Daughter of Frankenstein. Uh, which has nothing to do with the original Frankenstein, but it's a very interesting book. And one thing more I would like to uh, uh, say about reading. The, the Z generation, which is the after millennial uh, generation, has been reading for years now all on their iPhone, or, well, on their smartphones or tablets or whatever. It's mainly on their phones, okay? they do not have the challenge to change from paper to electronic. They are already electronic readers. It's not like, well, you're much younger than I am, but uh, it's not like my children. I, I was born much before <laughs> the, the digital age. So I've had to adapt. I like it and I read a lot in electronic, but uh, for the new generation, that's not, uh, you know, it's, it's not a choice they have to confront. It's, it's just the reality, they read electronically. So that's something we should take in, into consideration. We should, we should take it into consideration. And also I think, as you mentioned, uh, publishers as well should take it into consideration that this is an opportunity for, for a lot of publishers to consider digital. If they haven't done that before, then this is a, a chance for them to really take that leap of faith and really explore publishing uh, in digital format. 
Nacho, thank yes. you so much for it's this. A, just one, if I may add something else, we should also look, uh, looking at the, at the music industry and what happened to music rights and, and all that, we should start working on something before we have to start working against something, okay? Uh, I don't know if I was, I was clear. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's good that's advice. Me. Let's be proactive. Let's be proactive. Not reactive. Not reactive. That's really good advice, and it's brilliant to end this interview with. I could talk to you all day, Nacho, but we have to wrap up. Thank you so much for allowing us to take this time to get to know you a little bit better, to learn a little bit about Latin America and the Ibero-American Publishers Association, and hopefully we'll have a chance to see you in person at an upcoming book fair. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Bodur, and I hope that we have the chance at Grupo Iberoamericano to interview you so we Latin Americans can learn about the Arab world, the Arab publishing world. Happy to do that. And thank you to all the listeners you, and be back with more interviews. Uh, just check the IPA website and keep informed of our next series of interviews. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.